Good morning. Not used to the microphone being on, I guess. First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10 is an important little bit of text. In the morning class, what are we doing? We are looking at the book of Numbers. Book of Numbers is a surprisingly interesting book when you start to focus in on it. It's got uh, three prophecies concerning the Christ. Well, actually, there's two prophecies. Well, maybe there's three. The, the, the three that some people like to claim is, is, is Numbers chapter 9, verse 12, and, it's, and he's only describing the Passover and, and not breaking the bones. But that part of the lamb and its bones not getting broken is also found in Exodus chapter 12. So I really can't say that that's one of the prophecies. But another prophecy is coming out of Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, and that was the when the fiery serpents went around and was biting everybody. And then he said, put a bronze serpent on a staff and everybody looks up to it. Well, Jesus quotes that in John chapter three, verse 14, saying that that's referencing to how he was going to die, how he will be raised up. Uh, let me just grab that quote here. Um, As Moses was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. So that's a really good prophecy. And then in uh, Numbers chapter 24, 17, there was the prophecy made by Balaam concerning a star was going to rise up out of Israel and, and the scepter was going to come from Judah. So that was referring to the, the, the star of Bethlehem. That's where the, uh, the Magi went to so that they knew to come to Israel, to come to Israel to worship the, you know, the, um, the king of the Jews. And that's why they showed up at Jerusalem. So those two really, but we're going to look at a third one, I think, that I'm going to apply. Uh, I think some people do and some people don't. So, but first, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Yeah, didn't I say to go there? Why? Because he's saying you've got to turn to numbers and be encouraged by it. Because you have to learn. You always have to learn from the mistakes of others. And in the Old Testament, there's the mistakes what do we have? We have the mistakes in the Old Testament. Um, am I on screen here? No, I'm not even on screen. Jeffrey, you took yourself off screen. No. Okay, we're fine. Now they can see my messed up face. I kind of got a black eye this last week. Minor details. Anyways, where am I? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, for I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and ate the same spiritual drink and drank the same spiritual drink, for they're all drinking from the spiritual rock, which followed them. The rock was Christ. Okay, that's the book of Exodus, right? That's when God delivered them. But now we slide into the book of Numbers. Because you're always looking at the Old Testament to see, okay, don't do this, don't do that, and then bring it forward and see the spiritual relationship. Now, these things happen as an example for us that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. So when you come into Christ and you get baptized like they got baptized, we get baptized in, into the water. They got baptized through the Red Sea with the cloud over top. We get baptized into Christ, they got baptized into Moses, into Christ's teaching, into Moses' teachings is how that kind of turned out. But he's saying, do not be idolaters as some of them were. When they got to the mountain of Sinai, what happened? Well, 3,000 died because they went back to idolatry. They couldn't leave Egypt alone. They had that in them. And so then God had to eliminate 3,000 people because so the point is, when you come out of the world of darkness, understand you become a Christian, but you still have those sinful tendencies, and you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to get rid of those habits that you got before you became a Christian. And if you keep those habits and those things, you're going to be in big trouble. you got to learn to get rid of those things. So idolatry was one, nor act like nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. And that's what Brother James was talking about, 
right? Well, he talked about it last Sunday with the, the sin of Peor, which Balaam told Balak, well, look, if you send in the dancing girls, it'll, it'll wipe them out immorally. And that's exactly what happened. And then God had the, the Levites put the sword on and go take out those guys that turned to, to Baal worship. And they killed 24,000. But here it says 23,000. But there's a, there's a kicker here. It says 23,000 fell in one day. Well, 24,000 died. Well, I guess a couple of days later, a few guys were dying from their wounds, if you understand what I'm saying. So it's, it's not a conflict at all. Uh, 24,000 perished, but they didn't all die in that one day. 23 in one day, which is absolutely incredible. Because God doesn't accept immorality in the body of Christ, nor let us try the Lord. Some were destroyed by the serpents, right? And, and, and that's where we see the uh, bronze serpent raised on, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. I used to think this was Korah, but it's not. It's when they went into the promised land or got to the promised land and sent the 12 spies. The 12 spies came out, 10 grumbled and said, we can't do it. They're too strong for us. And the whole congregation grumbled all night. And the next day, God said, that's it. <laughs> None of you is going in except for Joshua and Caleb. All you guys, 603,000, you're all going to perish in the wilderness and perish they did. Because if you get this one grumbler going, now you've got two. You know, to, to have a grumbler, he needs ears, right? Because if nobody's going to listen to him, he can't grumble. But if you listen to the whiners and complainers and the grumblers and then the grumbling and then the grumbling, you know, it spread through 1.8 million people lost their spiritual lives because of those 10 guys, those 10 spies. And God gave them a plague and it wiped out those 10 guys the very next day. As for the rest of the people, they were condemned to perish for the next 38 years. They were wandering in the wilderness and perished. And so what does he say? These things, verse 11, happened to them as an example. God doesn't care about your numbers. What does God care about? God cares about purity, cares about obedience, right? I'm sorry, he wiped out the world, which was what? One billion people when the flood happened and eight souls came through. Why? Because there was only eight that were obedient. God's looking for obedience. And what we're seeing here in Numbers is he replaces this whole generation. Actually, it's almost like two generations, right? 40 years, all these people die, and it's the next generation. So if you're worried about numbers, don't. You better focus on obedience. And it better be focused on my obedience, because it's my obedience that sets the example for everybody else there's what you need and you gotta look out for what grumblers these things were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall because as soon as you think you're secure you're in big trouble we've seen some of the best fall you look stateside there's so many really good preachers even so-called pb evangelists right don't ever be confident so there's a lot of lessons in numbers that you've got to be aware of and what i'm going to look at today is numbers chapter 19 hey somebody was asking me what what is this about a red heifer right what is this well Okay, now what I want you to put in your mind is the red heifer is Christ. That's who the red heifer is. Now, oh, I'll get some people will, will argue with me, but I do have a dictionary at home. It says a heifer is a young female cow that hasn't given birth or a young ox. It can be either or. Does it matter? No, I'm not going to argue if it's going to matter, male or female, but it's a red heifer. Now, catch this. The Lord spoke to Moses, 19.1, and, and Aaron, and saying, so he's speaking to Moses and Aaron. Now, you got to picture this as Christ, okay? 
This is the statue of the law, which the Lord has commanded, saying, speak to the sons of Israel that they bring you an unblemished red heifer, which has in which is no defect and on which no yoke has ever been placed. Well, tell the sons of Israel who Moses go tell the sons of Israel, you and Aaron to to get me a red heifer. Well, guess what? That's what Caiaphas does. Uh, to tell the sons to bring to them. Where am I looking for? Chapter uh, 12, 49 in the, in the Gospel of John. Who do we have? We've got um, Caiaphas. Actually, I think it's chapter, yeah, chapter 11, verse 49, which says, one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now, he was not saying this on his own initiative, but being the high priest, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. So it's Caiaphas saying, we've got to capture this guy who? This red heifer who's unblemished, which kind of matches as well with the... Passover lamb, one-year-old, unblemished, right? So that's the way you need to see it. Oh, he didn't have a yoke. Well, Jesus never fell under anybody's responsibility. Jesus was his own. As a matter of fact, he had his own. Because he say, you know, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. So he's got his own. So Caiaphas is, is giving the order. Judas comes up with the plan. Uh, Mark chapter uh, 14, uh, verse 10 through verse 11. And I'm just going to back these, these things up. So Mark chapter 14, Judas Iscariot, verse 10, was, was one of the 12, went off to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this promised to give him money, and he began seeking how to betray at an opportune time. We've got to capture Christ and bring him to the high priest, Moses and Aaron, or actually Annas and Caiaphas. So Judas goes out and arrests Jesus. Uh, verse 43 of Mark chapter 14, immediately while Jesus was speaking, Judas, one of the 12, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and scribes and elders. And he gave him the kiss. They arrested him and brought him to John chapter 18. Now, this is kind of cool because in John chapter 18, there's, there's the two of them. There is both, and both of them are high priests. You can only have one high priest, but there's two high priests because the Romans were installing high priests so Annas, the original high priest, remained high priest. So in John chapter 18, verse 12, the cohort and the commanders and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus, bound him, led him to Annas first, and he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. So he's the, he's the big guy behind it all. And nobody knows about Annas until John writes the Gospel of John. You don't see him mentioned, right? Until everybody is dead. And now John writes in 78. Let me give you the details here, right? So Jesus comes to him first, but he doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. He just wants to question him concerning his disciples because he's losing money from the temple. That's, that was his great concern. He already knew that he was going to have Jesus killed and he was going to send him to, well, verse 24, Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, because he already had Caiaphas set up to find the charges and get rid of this guy, right? So the sons of Israel brought Jesus, the red heifer, to Moses and Aaron, Annas and Caiaphas, but what do you need to do? You shall give it to Eliezer, the priest, and it shall be brought outside the camp and be slaughtered in his presence. So you need to understand that the, both high priests were just there to have the execution lined up 
And now they give it to Eliezer. Well, Eliezer isn't anything. He's going to be the next high priest, but he's not at, the, at that time. So Eliezer is a chief priest. Give it to the chief priest. Well, the Sanhedrin met in the morning, right? And they decided that, yes, we need to take him to Pilate. So they found Jesus accused and they took him to Pilate. Pilate sentenced him to be crucified. And where do they crucify him? Outside the camp. And who's going along for the ride? Well, all the chief priests and the elders are making sure that this one dies and that Pilate's going to do it. But it's not the two high priests are not in charge of that. And it's in this is really interesting wording you'll find in, in Hebrew. Hebrews is very cool because Hebrews mentions the red heifer and Hebrews has some really interesting language such as chapter 13, verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also that he might be that he might sanctify. Now, you need to remember that I didn't mention this, but the, the red heifer is is set up to sanctify the people, to cleanse the people. So Jesus, so that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So <laughs> let, it, let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And, and that's the same language that he's using right here in, in, in Numbers 19, right? It shall be brought outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. And that's what Jesus was. He was taken by the priests outside the camp and slaughtered in their presence. And the word slaughtered, which is, if you look at Christ, that's what looks like he went through. But it, it's, it's also translated slain. And that's what you do to any, any animal sacrifice. You can translate that word to slay or to slaughter. And that's the same, it's the same Hebrew word for sacrifice in his presence. So, and then Eliezer shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle it towards the front of the tent of meeting seven times. Well, whenever the, the priest sprinkles with his finger the blood and they would do it towards the tent of meeting and they would do it towards the altar and do it towards the people, that was for sanctification. And I don't know how to necessarily apply it here other than when Jesus died on the cross. The temple curtain was torn totally in two. And now the way was sanctified for us to approach the throne of grace to receive mercy. So it's like a new way was established as soon as Jesus died on the cross. We can now enter into the throne room of God only because of the blood of Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, 22, you've come to Mount Zion, city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. So that's what that to me is, is talking about. And then he shall take the, then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. It's hide, it's flesh, it's blood, it's refuse shall be burned. You sacrifice it and now get rid of the body with a major, which, with a major fire. And it's interesting because Jesus talks about this. It, it seems like he's talking about this in, in Luke chapter 12 verse 50 and it's not a baptism of fire but what he says is do you suppose oh it's a bit, give me a sec here am i in chapter 12 luke chapter 12 verse 50 ah yeah there it is chapter 12 verse 50 i have i have a baptism to undergo and how distressed i am until it's accomplished He's already been baptized by John, so he's referring to his baptism of death, which he's going to undergo. And it's interesting that James and John show up with their mom. And do I have that in Luke or I've got that in, in, in Mark? And they want to be sitting on his right and on his left. At least that's what his, their mom wants them, right? So grant so we can sit on one on your right and one on your left. In verse 38 of Mark chapter 10, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? He's not referring to the baptism of John. He's not referring to them getting baptized on the day of Pentecost. He's referring to dying 
we are able, the cup that I drink, you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or left, well, that's for my father to decide. But he's talking about this baptism of fire, this persecution, his execution is what he's talking about in that situation. And the whole body has to be burned. And we know that coming out of Exodus chapter 12, because we know that Jesus, when you look at the comparison, is the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. And in, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 10, you should not leave any of the Lamb over until morning. Whatever is left until morning, you shall burn with fire. There cannot be a body. Bones, everything you get rid of. And that's representative of Acts chapter 1, the ascension of Christ. His body is gone, totally. So that's the fire that we see here. And now some really cool stuff, I think. Like, you know, you can just read it. But why is it in there? Is it only in there for those guys? Or is it in there for us? Well, they didn't get to read all that much in that, you know, over all this period of time. It's really written for us, recorded for us. The priest, what? Shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet material, cast it into the midst of the burning heifer. Why? Why these three? And it's interesting. Well, I like running with three. But if you look at the tabernacle, there's three things inside the Ark of the Covenant, right? You've got Aaron's rod, which represents the resurrection because it came back to life. You got the jar of manna, which represents Christ himself because Christ is the, the true manna that came down from heaven and the 10 commandments written on stone. And Jesus is the word. Oh, this is sort of cool because the 10 commandments are written on stone, right? Well, in John chapter one, one was the word. And then in 14, it says the word became flesh. No longer written on stone, but now it's able to be written on our hearts, right? So what's with the cedar wood? Well, I say the cedar wood represents the cross. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna build a fence and you're gonna have fence posts, guess what? You got to do cedar. Cedar is the best wood, it does not rot. And for the cross, it, the stipes, the straight up and down post for the cross, it was always there in the ground. It's the cross beam is what Jesus would have struggled to carry and Simon would have to carry it. And the cross beam itself weighed 75 pounds. No man could carry a cross because the stipes would have been 150 pounds in and of itself. And then you throw 75 pounds. No, that's not how it happens. So they get him and they nail his hands and then they put the cross piece up and it, I guess it's a pigeon fit, how that would happen. And then they push up his legs and then they nail his feet to the cross. So this, and this is really cool because I love to bring up one of my favorite books and you really need to understand this book because it is the most beautiful poetic book in the Bible. And it's all about you. Wow, there's a book about me. Yeah, there's, there's a book about you in the Bible and it's called Song of Songs. Absolutely. It's about your relationship with Christ. Chapter three is all about the crucifixion of Christ, the, the Jesus wedding day. And in chapter three, it says in verse nine, King Solomon, Solomon, Solomon means peace. The king of peace, who Christ has made for himself a sedan chair from the timbers of Lebanon. The timbers of Lebanon are known to be the cedars, right? And the sedan chair was the cross. He made it himself so that he could be held upright like the bronze serpent. So that's what the that's what that's representing. And, and, uh, and I've got that in there. Yeah. So the cedar wood represents the cross. Now, this is interesting. The hyssop. What in the world? Why would you throw hyssop in? Well, the hyssop is how the blood was sprinkled from the old covenant. And he says so, I think I've got it here in Hebrews. 
chapter 9, verse 19, and I love pulling it out of the, the, the New Testament because it's coming from the, and it's coming from the Old Testament, but in Numbers or Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19 to 22, the Hebrew author says, when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet, wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So what you got to capture here is that hyssop is the means upon which the blood is sprinkled, which purifies everything. Well, he's throwing the hyssop into the fire. Why? Because there's no longer an old covenant. Because Jesus was going to give us a new covenant. And Jesus is going to give us a new hyssop. Because I, I don't know if you have noticed, but I don't have a hyssop up here and I sprinkle stuff on you, right? But you have to be sprinkled with the blood of Christ. You are washed in the blood of Christ when you go down into the waters of baptism. But it's interesting, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, what does Peter say? Huh. According to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus and what? Be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be upon you. You have to get sprinkled by the blood. Because we sin every day. Right? So what's the hyssop that allows us to get sprinkled by the blood of Christ? Well, First John chapter 1 if we have, if we had, we say if we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice. If we walk in the light, what's the light? The light is the word of Christ. If you stay in the word of Christ, if you walk in the light as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What's the new hyssop? The new hyssop's the it's the word of God, it's the living word of God. And as long as I continue to walk in the light as he himself is in the light. Okay, now this is a little off topic, but I love this. John chapter 13. What's John chapter 13? Going to wash your feet. But what does Jesus say? Peter says, no. Verse 8, you shall not wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Well, okay, wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head. <laughs> he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. You see, once you come into Christ, you've, you've been made clean, but you still struggle with sin. So Jesus has to wash our feet. His blood is that which washes our feet. So every time I sin, he's got to wash my feet. That's the concept I need to envision that when I go to God in prayer, it's the blood of Christ that cleanses me when I ask God to forgive me. I walk in the light as he himself. The blood of his son continues to cleanse me. Jesus continues to wash my feet. And that's what I put him through. That's what he was willing to do. He wasn't just washing their feet. He washes our feet. We've been fully cleansed, but we still struggle. And we still grieve the spirit. I, you're doing that again? Uh, he still has to wash our feet. I thought you got over that. Still has to wash our feet. So the hyssop is the new covenant. Okay, and this one's even cooler. <laughs> the scarlet, right? The scarlet material. Well, I'm going to call it the scarlet string. In Hebrews, he calls it the scarlet wool. Well, yes, of course. Why? Because it's a string made of wool. So what, what is this? You see it someplace in Leviticus. And in Leviticus is when he was sacrificing the two pigeons. 
And this is the only other place which is really similar. I'm looking for Leviticus chapter three, because I'm just trying to pull it all together. Like, you know, it, you can't just read it in this one book, but guess what? Everything goes everywhere because it's like, it's like water. But in Leviticus chapter three, when he's sacrificing the pigeons, he's also putting in cedar, hyssop, and scarlet. But scarlet what? Verse six, if his offering of, of, for sacrifice, oh, come on, please don't tell me I'm on the wrong. Chapter, oh, chapter three, no, it's book three, chapter 14. That's what you get when you're doing it with numbers here. Leviticus 14, that's the one, the cleansing of the leper and the bird, verse six. As for the live bird, he shall take it together. You sacrifice one bird over running water, but the live bird, he shall take it together with cedar wood, scarlet string, and the hyssop. And he shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water, and he shall sprinkle it seven times over the one who's been cleansed from leprosy and pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. So there's, you got those three interesting things in there. You've got the forgiveness of sins, the cleansing, the sanctification, but you got to have, you know, you got to have the sacrifice and you got to have the cedar wood. You got to have the scarlet string and you got to have the hyssop, which is just, showing us there's something there so i'll because there's no word there for material if you're looking in numbers 19 it just says scarlet well uh here he's got the string so scarlet we know represents blood and a string is a it's a line right you make a line with a string so it's the bloodline the bloodline yeah this is kind of interesting it's all really interesting, right? Genesis chapter 38. Here we have in Jesus' bloodline, two twins being born. And what happens? One sticks his hand out first, right? And there were twins in her womb. Verse 38, chapter 38 of Genesis, verse 28. And one put out a hand and the midwife took the scarlet thread, scarlet string, uh, tied it on his hand saying, this one came out first. But he drew it back and his, his hand back and behold, his brother came out and she called, she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. And so he was named Perez. So the string identified the children. Perez was the one in Jesus' lineage, not his brother, Sarah. Okay, so I understand that the, the string is as an identifier and then we see that same string way over in, I'm running out of time, Joshua. And that's with the two spies and Rahab. Oh, look, Rahab, where is she? She's in the lineage of Christ. Matthew chapter one, verse whatever. And she was told to leave the scarlet string hanging down and her and her whole family would be delivered, delivered. And she has the child, which is in the lineage of Christ. And then, the third time, oh, back to that crazy book of mine, Song of Solomon, describing you. This is so cool. I'm sorry, you're going to get tired of that, aren't you? Yeah. Song of Solomon, in describing you, I'm not even going to turn there, but it is found someplace in chapter 4, verse 3. Your lips are a scarlet string. Oh, I had to look up that this morning. What, what? Your lips. What's the importance of lips? you got to have lips to speak. It gives pronunciation. It's the words which you speak are like a scarlet string. It identifies who you are to people in the world. And when people hear us speak, we're speaking as it were the oracles of God. Your lips are the most beautiful thing. How beautiful are the feet? No, how beautiful are the lips? Because they're sharing the good news with the people. And that's how he describes her lips, because that's your communication. Lips are an absolutely important part of our body, and we totally ignore that, right? So it's the bloodline. <laughs> and I can't say this is cool, but, you know, 
you only see Jesus' bloodline in Matthew chapter 1, and it starts with Abraham and goes to Christ, right? But it always ends with Christ. But then if you go to Luke chapter 3, it starts with Jesus, and it goes to God, the Son of God. It's the total lineage, but it always ends at Christ. Why? Because he is the final king of kings, Lord of lords. And now who are we? We are his children. We are his people. We are 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for God's own possession, so that we may proclaim, use your lips, the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Oh, and speaking of lips, that is, uh, I just got to, uh, there it is. Um, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Let us then, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. We are his people. He is our king. The lineage stopped when he died and became king of kings, lord of lords. That's what these three things represent. He is what? Oh, yeah, I wrote this down. Alpha and Omega. Then that's repeated only three times in the scriptures, in the book of Revelation. Phew. Oh, man, I got to finish this up. Okay. It, it really flies. Like, I mean, that's the first seven verses, right? So the priest who has the witnesses, right? He's unclean. So what has he got to do? He's got to be sprinkled with the water. So you take the ash and you mix it with the water, living water, and picture the ash as the Holy Spirit. Mix it with the living water, which is the word of God. Now the priest needs to get sprinkled with it and then catch this. He has to wash his clothes, bathe in water, and he's unclean until evening. And then the one who burns it, has to do the very same thing. And the one who gathers it has to do the very same thing. So what's happening here? Well, the priests were unclean. They're the ones that executed Christ. The priests represent the Jews. What do the Jews have to do? Well, you have to wash your clothes. What does that mean? It means you have to repent because your clothes are your actions. Your clothes represent who a person is. And then Judy says, hey, even the garments upon which they wear. So you've got to repent from the way you present yourself in the world and the things in which you do. And then you have to what? You have to wash your body, which is what? You have to get baptized. And all three have to do the same thing. And the interesting thing is you're not clean until evening. So what's that saying? Well, I, I could change on this one. I'm not absolutely sure, but until the end of your life, you're never going to be absolutely clean. You're always going to struggle with sin. You always need to go to Christ for forgiveness of sins. You need to get your hands on this holy water, this sanctifying water, which is the spirit with the word. When you're a Christian, you've got full access to it. You always got to keep coming back to God and asking for forgiveness is what you've got to do. And here's the really neat thing. We're just piling up on neat stuff. Verse 18. So how does all this work? Well, a clean person shall take the hyssop, dip it in the water, and the water is the running water and the ash, and sprinkle it on the tent and all the furnishings and the persons who were there and on the one who touched the bone or whatever. Verse 19. The clean person. Who's the clean person? The clean person's a Christian. The clean person shall sprinkle on the unclean, now catch this, the third day and on the seventh day, and on the seventh day he shall purify him from uncleanness, and he shall on the seventh day wash his clothes, bathe himself, and shall be clean by evening. Same thing. So how does this look in, in the New Testament? Well, Make this all short. Paul's conversion. Paul was, first three days, totally in the dark, right? Totally unclean. But then Jesus came to him. 
and convicted him. That's John chapter 3, 5. You cannot be born again. You can't be born from above unless you've come water and the spirit. Water is the word of God. The spirit is the Holy Spirit. The spirit gives conviction. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. You have to be convicted in heart. Paul was convicted in heart, but then he had to sit for three days in darkness. Because you get convicted, but your born again experience is not a salvation experience. It's a conviction experience. Now you have to spend a few days, but you don't have to spend a few days. Some people get baptized right away, Ethiopian eunuch. Paul, no, he spent that time thinking, counting the cost. And then what happened? God says, sends Ananias to show up to what? Sprinkle him again. How does he get sprinkled? teaches him through the word. The word is that which sprinkles people. When we teach people, some get convicted, some don't. The conviction happens by the Holy Spirit. And then when we share, what do they say? What do I need to do? Ah, here comes the next sprinkling. This is what you need to do to become a Christian. Repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So on the day seven, he gets sprinkled again. And then immediately, what does the person do? He washes his clothes, he repents, and then he washes his body and he's baptized. And he shall be clean by nighttime. I know, it's crazy. It doesn't make sense. But think about it. Old Testament is the shadow. New Testament is the light. It's the sunshine. It's the reality. When you're looking at the old, the red heifer of Numbers chapter 19, God's trying to show us in the future there is going to, well, he's giving these guys right here an opportunity to sanctify themselves, to cleanse themselves. And it also states in here, if you do not do this on this seventh day, if you do not get sprinkled twice by the water, you're condemned. You're no longer a part of the people of Israel is what he's saying. And it's pointing to a time in the future when God's going to allow us to get our sins totally forgiven, to come into a relationship with Christ. And how do we do it? Well, it's really interesting how this all just sort of opens up and we can see the, how all these scriptures fit with the New Testament. And that a clean person can go to an unclean person and help them when they understand that they're unclean, help them. Holy Spirit convicts them. They get a second time a few days later after they learn, because people need to count the cost before they actually commit themselves to Christ. A few days later, let's just add, how do you become a Christian? And here's what you got to do. Repent and be baptized. And then they're in the body of Christ. And it, it, I think it's just absolutely beautiful how the red heifer points to Christ. Jesus is also seen as the, uh, the Passover lamb, but I believe he's seen as the red heifer. And it's Paul's conversion just fits through all of this. And the thing you need to understand is everything is made possible here because Christ fulfilled it when he fulfilled it by going to the cross. By the love of Christ, he not only paid the penalty, he loved us so much that he freely paid the penalty. His death set us free from sin and made us clean. So we can now enter into the presence of God, heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels, Hebrews chapter 12. And here's something to think about. We are now, once you're a Christian, we are now empowered to help others come to God. Because we know how to do it. Because we are clean. The same way it happened to us, we can share it with everybody else. And the question I leave you with is, are you using your talents? to be a blessing to others because God's given us all the talents we need. That's the red heifer. If you want notes, I'll send them out because I gave you too many scriptures. Thank you.